so you know the book is titled Rappers Deluxe. Right here, as you can see. Uh, that was obviously inspired by the Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight, the first top 40 rap song. What's the difference between uh, Rapper's Delight and Rapper's Deluxe? Well, you know, um, I kept thinking about Rapper's Delight as the first uh, commercially available you know, rap song. And that's the point at which, you know, most people outside New York heard it for the first time. And I wanted to kind of you know, play off of that. And I just kept thinking of like, you know, deluxe. When something is deluxe, it's like extra. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like special edition. It's like there's more to it. You know, think about a album that had like, you know, additional features, um, you know, instrumentals, um, bonus cuts, mm -hmm. um, you know. Hidden tracks. Hidden tracks. That's another thing. Yeah, like, you know, basically the idea being you're getting more than what you're paying for. We're going to give you a little extra. This is deluxe. This is not a regular offering. This is a deluxe offering. Um, you know, you go to a fast food spot, you know, it's like you want to supersize it, right? Like, I was thinking about topic that I've been seeing in Instagram comments recently is the idea of artists being industry plants, you know, meaning that the industry literally planted a person with no talent huh. <laughs> um, that no one has ever heard of and whose growth and path to stardom we've never seen. You know, that's my definition. I say who, that to who say... Who are they calling a plant? Who would they call a plant? Um... You trying to you trying to bait me into getting no, trouble? No, no, no. I, I mean, I've heard that. I don't know that I actually knew what it was. I've heard people yeah. say it. I don't think I've paid as much attention to the conversation. Is there anybody particular they would call a plant? Lil Nas X. Okay. okay. They would consider him a plant? I would understand that because I, I don't think, I mean, I feel like he just came out of nowhere with Old Town Road. You know, I and I usually pay attention to an artist's trajectory from like okay. mixtape days until they sign a record deal. But right. yeah, that could be a yeah. You could. And identify. they're saying that they this person was planted there to what do what? Um, it depends on whatever people think agenda is being pushed with that artist. Okay, gotcha. Um, but you know, I say that to say. None of the members of the Sugar Hill Gang were rappers prior to Rapper's Delight. Right. So were they industry plants? I wouldn't say they were industry plants because, you know, there really was no industry around hip-hop at the time. I mean, the story of the Sugar Hill Gang is funny because, you know, this is such a hugely influential song, and they had never performed together. They weren't a group. And, you know, a lot of the lyrics are Grandmaster Kaz. Mm-hmm. Somebody else's lyrics. I mean, it's a creation. Yeah. And I just find it kind of funny because so much of hip hop is about authenticity, about being authentic, you know, but the group that first, first big first, rap. <laughs> yeah, like somebody made this up in a studio. Um, Sylvia. So you know, not Sylvia plants. Robinson. Not plants, but experiments. Well, this is capitalism, mm. you know, and I mean, I like to quote Barzini, you know, from The Godfather. After all, we are not communists, right? People trying to get a bag any way they can. I mean, Sylvia Robinson was motivated to cash in on the phenomenon of rap music. And her son, Joey, you know, heard, um, you know, these dudes at the pizza parlor, and, you know, come to the studio. And that's when my man says, and so I bought two friends along, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's a crazy story. Um, and hip hop transcended that, but you know, I mean, it started from the fact that somebody was trying to make a buck. And so it's just kind of funny to me, um, uh, because you know, people have done all sorts of things to make money. This one happened to work and look what it, you know, uh, created, you know,
know, afterwards. But the story itself is hilarious. Yeah, it is. Think about it. It was not these, like, seasoned, you know, figures from the underground who came to cash in initially. Such an ironic story. It is. (laughs) Yeah. That's all you had to say on that? Basically. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Sylvia Robinson is a visionary. You know, I mean, people definitely question um, her, uh, you know, later her her integrity as a business person, but um, visionary nonetheless. So, I mean, would you say that she pretty much created the rap music industry? Well, you know, I think one of the questions people ask me sometimes is about women in hip-hop. And I'm like, a woman started hip-hop, you know? Mm. I mean, at least the commercially available form of hip-hop and you consider Sylvia's uh, history prior to this, you know, as a uh, singer, Mickey and Sylvia, and then yeah. you know, Sylvia, the R&B singer. Um, I mean, I remember seeing Sylvia on Soul Train singing Pillow Talk um, long before uh, Rappers of Light came out. When it came out and I later realized she was the one behind it, I'm like, oh, wow, that's cool. Like, yeah. You know, it's somebody from the industry who I had some familiarity with. Um, I mean, to me, Sylvia deserves mad props, and that's why I mention her in the book. Like, the person who started this whole thing was a woman. Um, You know, and then what she did with Sugar Hill um, and the Sugar Hill record label is very important because, you know, we celebrate, you know, the Def Jams and the Bad Boys and the Rockefellers, and, I mean, people celebrate those things. You know, I mean, I'm from Detroit. Like, we started it all with Motown. Uh, we celebrate these things in the culture. So I think Sylvia deserves her props and what she did, you know. Um, however, um, you know, sort of, I don't know what the word is, uh, however sort of inauthentic the creative process may have been relative to those cats' background as rappers, the product she put out had a huge impact and we probably wouldn't be sitting here talking about this today if not for that. So hat tip. Definitely, you know. Um, man, it's a conflicting thing, you know, just for you know, knowing about uh later just how the business was handled with uh the message with Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five and her, you know, her business moves, but um I mean, Have you ever heard of any record label owner that somebody didn't say they got beat? Yeah, no. I, I mean, that's I the nature of the like. Yeah. Every time there's been a somebody who owned a record label, there's been somebody who was on that label who said they got beat out of their money. I think that's just the nature of the beast. Capitalism. Yeah, so, and I mean, particularly in the music industry. Um, you know, the music industry is a you know weird. You know, weird thing. Industry rule number 480, you know. Record company people are shady. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's it's funny. Whoever it is, no matter how much, you know, Barry Gordy, people were mad at Barry Gordy. They said Barry Gordy beat them. Um, you know, everybody who's owned a label that has any kind of prominence, somebody claimed that they beat them out of their money. So, I, I you know, I'm not saying they're wrong or they're lying. I'm saying that's kind of the nature of the beast. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, and then uh, the origins of the industry, even prior to Sylvia right. Robinson, the right. mob right. was involved. So, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, the whole record industry grew out of those connections. And so there's always been some suspicious things, you know, throughout history yeah. um, in the music industry. It's a unique business. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's different genres of music and entertainment that influence hip hop that you touch on in the book. Which one do you think had the largest impact? Um, you mean other than hip hop? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a real jazz cat, and uh, nobody really listens to jazz anymore. Um, so I have a few friends I could talk to about it, but it's not <laughs> widely appreciated. But I feel like what, you know, jazz musicians, the culture they created uh, from bebop forward, 40s to let's say the late 60s was really kind of a precursor 
to what became hip hop in terms of you had a critical mass of musicians in the same way you would come to have a critical mass of rappers and producers and a whole kind of ecosystem that grew up around them. So, you know, if you go back and you look at Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, you know, Max Roach, uh, all those cats, look at their album covers. If you know their history, if you learn about their circumstances, um, you recognize the controversies. I mean, it's really a precursor to what would later become hip hop because you had a culture. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one or two dudes, you know, it was different musicians, singers, women often who were singing different genres, different styles, all under jazz. Yeah. But you had your free jazz cats, you had, you know, your straight ahead cats, your bebop musicians, you know, your, your, your singers, uh, vocalists, what have you. I feel like that was, uh, uh, you know, sort of point along the way. And then so when you got to hip hop, it's like that had already existed, but in a different form. And then with hip hop, it got to be bigger. Yeah. So that's what I would say. I would say jazz gets, uh, uh, gets, does not always get the credit it deserves because jazz, unlike hip hop, was never popular in that same way. It was often over people's heads. I, uh, Rakim has said in interviews a lot that, you know, because Rakim is kind of used as like, I kind of look at the emergence of Rakim as like, you know, the difference between AD and BC. Mm -hmm. Like Rakim is like AD. Like okay. once he started rapping, people really start right. caring about lyricism. Right. Um, you know, it was a little bit more... Uh, it was a little bit more nursery rhyme-ish before Rakim. Um, well, dudes were, you know, bragging and talking shit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it wasn't really developed. I mean, I give props to Melly Mel and Duke Booty on the yeah. message because, you know, that was ahead of his time. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of dudes, I mean, you know, before Rakim, you had the fat boys. And, yeah. Um, it wasn't all, I mean, you know, you had others too, but it was like party. Yeah. You know, party and bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Um Hyping the crowd, it was it was maybe fun and Houdini has some lyrics, but Rakim made it to me. Rakim made it poetry. He's like to me the, the like the the foundation, like the blueprint of the modern lyricist. Yeah, every everything traces back to Rakim yeah. in terms of lyricism. Yeah. So, uh, you know, oh man, how, I forgot what I was going to say, but. Yes, uh, so Rakim, in interviews, he's talked about how, you know, people asked him, like, how come you rap so different than everybody back then? And he kind of gave that credit to jazz. I talk about that in the book. You yeah. Know, he, Rakim was a saxophone player. Yeah. And he said he wanted to approach rhyming like Coltrane played his horn, which is brilliant. Um, you know, I tell that story in the book where John Coltrane said he wanted to be able to come in to the middle of a sentence and then choose like which direction he would go in from there, which is deep. And so Rakim is is playing the saxophone and he's informed and influenced by somebody like Train. And then he approached that in terms of how he spit his lyrics. I mean, to me, that's just a brilliant example of creativity. Mm -hmm. um, Ingenuity. To have that connection to jazz, I mean, when you think about jazz, like, you had real musicians. Like, you had to play those instruments. Mm -hmm. um, so there was just a high level of intelligence and creativity. And for people who tapped into that, like, you know, it's just an endless source of creative information and inspiration. Yeah. Uh, you know, you brought up how out of uh, all the four elements of hip-hop, MCing is the element that quote, translated most easily into the world of commodified popular music. The MC came to be regarded as the leader, the figure around whom the record industry could build and market and identify, end quote. Outside of DJing, do you think that, do you think personally that uh, other elements of hip hop would become as successful if marketed properly? Well, I mean, you know, I think what I was saying was people were used to singers. Yeah. And so... MC, you could market the same way you could market market 
a singer, but how do you market a break dancer? <laughs> or how do you market a graffiti artist? Like, what does that look like? Is it a video or somebody tagging a building? Um, you know, like break dancing got some attention, but is that gonna have the same appeal as you know somebody spitting rhymes? Yeah, so turntablism. I mean, as they call it now, like being a DJ, is that gonna like look and sound as compelling as you know a rapper? I mean, I just think because we're used to singers and singers have persona, it's like okay, this person isn't singing, but we can market them like they're singing. They have a look, and they have a team, and they have a stylist, and you know, uh, their lyrics are things that people quote. And mm -hmm. It's just easier. I mean, I don't know how you could market those other elements to the same extent. You could market them, and they yeah. may have some appeal, but I don't know if they were something that you could market in such a way that we'd still be talking about them 50 years later. Yeah, I mean, I feel like nowadays they might take like somebody, like a, they might build a brick wall just for somebody to tag it's, up. Right. <laughs> it's kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I mean, if you were tagging, especially back then, even now, I mean, you know, this building in downtown yes. LA across from crypto, you know, they consider these people vandals. They consider them, you know, criminals. Yeah, um, I love it. They don't it. consider them artists. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, the building's sitting there, and the money dried up, and it's across from the arena, and it's unfinished. It's an eyesore, um, you know. But the taggers came along and found the canvas. So, you know, it's interesting because if you drive by there now, there are police all over the place, which oh, wow. you know seems maybe a bit after the fact. But um, you know, how do you? Commodify that. What are you going to film them tagging that? Um, and somebody, you know, who's doing that, if they know they're being filmed, they're not going to do it because they're going to get popped. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you monetize that. Yeah. I got some ideas, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe put it in a museum later, but. Hire an artist that, you know, tagged it and, you know. One artist. something. You mean like one artist? Or, or some of the best artists. Whoever, well, they need know. to they need to finish that building because yeah. otherwise it can't just sit there like that, um, you know. And I think that's but supposedly, if I'm not mistaken, I think they decided to build some structure so that people wouldn't be able to yeah. easily access it. But then they they're gonna have to figure out how they finish it. Yeah, I can't imagine tearing all that down, especially you know in a city like L.A. with such a um, you know big unhoused crisis is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a, a metaphor for something. Yeah, I <laughs> mean, you know, that building um, is connected to funding source in China, and they stopped funding it after it was, you know, almost finished. Yeah. And so what would you have to do to go in and finish it and I think what people are forgetting about is the fact that it's across the street from crypto, which used to be the stable center. Yeah. And even though the Clippers are moving because they're going to have their own arena, like, you know, do the Lakers and the Kings want a mm -hmm. homeless site across from the arena? Yeah. Um, in the middle of downtown? I mean, this was a luxury high rise. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we talk about graffiti just now. And, you know, hip-hop is a rebellious culture. That's what it started as. So do you think that uh, hip-hop is as rebellious as it was 50 years ago? No. No, I yeah. don't think so. And, you know, like I said, a 50-year-old person is maybe a lot less rebellious than a 25-year-old yeah, person. Yeah, true. So I, I think that's probably the case with hip-hop also. Yeah. Um, we got deeper into the book, and uh, well, as I got deeper into the book, you know, you talked about Basquiat's influence and and the ways he influenced hip hop. You said that uh, Basquiat was a cultural celebrity before the culture itself could truly accommodate him. What would cultural accommodations look like for Basquiat in the '80s? Well, you know what I what I what I meant when I said that was, 
I feel like now the culture has accommodated him. Like yeah. Basquiat has a place in hip hop. If you say Basquiat's name in hip hop, people know who you're talking about, right? Uh, rappers, you know, Jay Z and you know Ross, others yeah. have referenced owning Basquiat's Drake, et cetera, Quite a few actually. Um, you know, but at the time in the '80s, Basquiat, his career is really kind of confined to that one era because mm-hmm. he passed away. Um, and what he was doing, he was doing in a especially elite space, the white art world, the white world of contemporary art, you know, which back then I don't think anybody saw as connected to hip hop. But, you know, Basquiat first started getting attention creating these tags that he put up on walls. Um, and he was not like a graffiti artist like, you know, the real heads who yeah. were doing it, but he was inspired by what they did and did the same thing in, in you know, Soho and uh, Tribeca area where he knew the influential people in the art world might see it. Um, and when I look at his work, I mean, to me, it's hip hop. Like the look of it, the vibe of it, it's that same kind of energy. Um, and then Basquiat, you know, he became a celebrity. So, you know, you see this dude on the cover of New York Times magazine in an Armani suit barefoot, you know, with paint all over the place. Um, you know, the whole paint drip aesthetic um, is is influenced by him. Um, you know, he did it big. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he had some big appetites. Unfortunately, one of those appetites took him out of here. But yeah. You know, I think now the culture accommodates his work and his image. Um, you know, he looks like a cat that could be part of hip hop. Yeah, true. You know? So I mean Jay Z's locks kind of look like his a locks. Lot of, a lot of people say that, you know. So I think now, all these years later, we appreciate him in ways that he was ahead of his time in the art world and I think culturally speaking as well. And it took all this time to kind of bring the two together. Um, in the 80s, though, it was just too early. Yeah, too early, true. Sometimes it's just not your time. Right. Yeah. You know, hip-hop became commercially successful in the 80s and 90s, and uh, the hip-hop generation became a target audience for companies. Companies use rap and commercials. You brought up how uh, Bill Clinton was playing the sax on Arsenio Hall. Was this kind of pandering happening in the past with black music, like, prior to hip-hop? You mean in terms of what Bill Clinton did? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, black music and black culture is always an easy target for a hater. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, there's so many stereotypes that exist that you could just say, oh, this is the reason. And so, you know... Um, you know, for instance, this whole thing about using rap lyrics in criminal trials. Yeah. And I keep saying, you know, what if, I don't know what the contemporary example would be, but, you know, I mean, I guess in Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise might have to kill somebody, right? (laughs) What if, you know, somebody arrested Tom Cruise for the people he killed in Mission Impossible? (laughs) I don't know if he kills anybody in Mission Impossible or not, because I don't watch, but I'm familiar with Mission Impossible when it was on television, because I'm old. But my point is, what if, you know, people went to arrest Clint Eastwood, <laughs> you know, after outlaw Josie Wales because so many people he killed in the movie? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Right? So rappers, to me, are characters. I mean, very few rappers go by their government name. Um, so their name is a character. And they create personas. And it's oftentimes, more often than not, I would say, the dude that's rapping about it he didn't live it. Somebody else did. He observed yeah. it. Um, because the cat who's the best storyteller may not necessarily be the top gangster, mm-hmm. but he's a storyteller. Yeah. And he observes it, and he retells the story through the prism of a character. And so, yeah. you know, I think in that example, um, you know, here's somebody using the music um, in a very negative way because they're saying, no, what you, you said it is real, now you're going to be held accountable for it. We don't treat any other cultural form that way. So that's why I'm like, this is, to me, uh, 
problematic, but you know, you have a collection of black people in hip hop. And so for some people who have a different agenda, um, they can point to uh, this and say, you know, oh, it's rap music. And just by saying something like that, conjure up all sorts of images just based on stereotypes. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess hip hop is just held to that standard of, uh, I guess hip hop, I mean, racism, of course. Um, but I think hip hop lyrics are used so literally because of the fact that like, you know, people are, uh, expecting a certain kind of authenticity from rap because artists in rap are most of the time writing their own lyrics compared to like older genres of music where right. there'd yeah, be songwriters. songwriters right. So it's a held to that expectation. It's held to this, um, you know, art is a reflection of reality, but not always that person's reality. Like you said, it could be someone well, else's you're, reality. You're a storyteller. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, the stories you tell, um, doesn't mean they're necessarily even true. Um, it's a story, and mm -hmm. it's based on maybe true events. Yeah. But once you turn it into a story, it's it's different. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a, it's a conflicting topic because, I mean, would if Biggie was alive now and Niggas Bleed came out right now, would he get wrapped up in a Rico like Young Thug? Well, if he stayed out of Georgia, he might be okay. But if he was in Georgia, you can't say for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, uh, that song, I Got a Story to Tell, on that same album, you know, is something that supposedly transpired with an actual NBA player. Yeah, I know you're talking about. Yeah. no longer here. And um, I always thought about that. Yeah. Because, in one sense, that story is so crazy, it sounds made up. Yeah. Um, but imagine Biggie were he here, and the person who the story is supposedly mm. about, who's also no longer with us, imagine if you know they were here in the age of the internet and social media. Um, you know, would we see a podcast with the two of them sitting down <laughs> talking about that? Or it would probably just be the guy who was about on a podcast explaining or probably dispelling the rumor or something like that. Or Biggie saying, I was just talking shit. Like, yeah. who knows? You know, who knows? <laughs> Honestly, I could see that. I could see that on the bingo card for 2024. Uh, because I could see it. I could see it. Because there's a lot of uh, middle-aged black man beef going on the internet right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Shannon and... and uh, Mike Epps and everybody else. Now Eddie Griffin has joined in on it. <laughs> it's it's kind of ridiculous. It's like your uncle's fighting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All started with that Cat Williams interview. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is kind of crazy. Uh, you use Arkane's uh, 1958 portrait of Great Day in Harlem and uh, Gordon Parks' 1998 portrait of Great Day in Hip Hop as a backdrop to backdrop to explain the kinship between hip hop and jazz. You said through jazz had once, though jazz had once been thought of as marginal, never attaining true mainstream success, by the 1990s it had become something akin to high art. Now celebrated for its rich cultural legacy and often performed in some of the most distinguished venues. This year makes 44 years since the first commercially successful rap song. So do you think at this point hip-hop is looked at as high art? Um, not yet, mm. but I think uh, there are aspects of hip-hop that are going in that direction. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about jazz and you think about the place that jazz is performed, you know, Disney Hall here in L.A. or jazz at Lincoln Center in New York, um, various other places throughout the country. Um, jazz music, even in, say, you know, a club setting, is often thought of as, like, cultural. You know, like, you're going to listen to jazz like you're going to get something cultural um, because it's been around so long. And, um, I mean, I you know, I listen to jazz as much as I listen to hip-hop, but the reactions I get from people outside of select few are sort of astonishment 
Like, yeah. you actually listen to this. Or what I get from some people is like, wow, like, you really know jazz and not just the popular names. You don't just know Miles Davis and Duke Ellington. You know, like, real musicians that, like, only people who study jazz would know. So um, I think hip-hop is not yet at that level. I mean, yeah. you know, I mentioned Nas at you know, the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Wu Tang is, you know, doing their thing in Colorado initially and then in Vegas. And mm -hmm. um, you're starting to see more of this. I mean, even if you watch these Tiny Desk concerts on yeah. NPR. Jeezy with a, with a, uh, with a orchestra, pretty much. Right, right. And others as well. Yeah. You know, I've seen Ross do that. You know, and I love it. I think it's great. Um, I wrote a piece back in the 2000s, and I ended it by saying, don't be surprised when you see Biggie Smalls with strings. And, you know, here we are. Like, you know. Niggas Bleed had strings on that. Yeah, dude. I mean, so, but like with a full orchestra. Yeah. Like backing up. I could like, see it. You know, um, this cat, um, you know, who's the former student here, uh, Miguel Atwood Ferguson, who has a, whole uh, movement dealing with like orchestral music and, and hip hop, dealing with Jay Dilla and others. Um, so, you know, may take a little bit more time, but hip hop will ultimately be the sort of thing that, you know, people are going to these prestigious cultural venues to hear. And, um, you know, people send me clips and things all the time of, some version of that, like somebody taking some classic hip hop song and trying to, you know, make it orchestral. Yeah. But you know, I mean, at this point, we're talking about classic music, uh, if not classical. So, I don't think hip hop's there yet, but it's it's on the way. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. I'm, I mean, you think you have a timeline for that? I mean, it, it really has to do with the fact that, you know. Jazz was in his heyday uh, back in, let's say, mid 50s to late 60s, mid six, mid 40s to late 60s. If you want to start with bebop, um, you know, the music was like intellectual or perceived as such. If you look at those old jazz album covers, which is some great, you know, cover art, you know, you'll see like Blue Note Records guys in the midst of their process. It didn't picture them as entertainers. It yeah. pictured them as intellectual. <clears throat> you know, these photographs, for instance, you'd see from that time where people use smoke, like cigarette smoke as an aesthetic. Um, when you add the classical component, when you're around long enough, um, you know, when you can look back on that and there's nostalgia, and it's like, okay, I want to do Illmatic, but instead of me running around on stage with some Tims and, you know, camouflage pants, I'm going to put on a tuxedo and have an orchestra yeah. and get you to experience the whole thing in a different way. I mean, that elevates the album. Yeah. And it also speaks to where Nas is and where the people who grew up listening to that music, you're not going to some hip hop club yeah. to listen to that, but you might go to some prominent cultural venue you know, with a, a partner or a spouse or whatever, a date, um, however you choose to do it. And, like, this is an, this is an evening of culture because hip-hop is at that level. It's not just popular yeah. anymore. It's also critically acclaimed and yes. has been, I think, for a long time. Yeah, and I think it's actually, like, a natural trajectory because, I mean, sampling is the foundation of hip-hop, you know, instrumentation, and... A lot of these early rap songs sampled jazz and other genres. So if you just take the instruments from those genres and, you know, you can perform, you can recreate these classic rap albums. I think it would blend, perf it blends perfectly. It adds a different component to the music. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about just fashion as well. Um, one thing I noticed in this generation is that basketball sneakers are solely for performance, um, and they don't translate to fashion and everyday use, like basketball sneakers in the 80s and 90s. Um, 
Like Jays, you mean? Like Jays or Barclays, Pippins. Yeah. Um, you think we'll get back to the time where basketball sneakers are considered stylish enough to wear off the court? Because I feel like I mean, a lot of that. people wear sneakers now, though. Yeah. In place of dress shoes. Yeah. Um, and some people I see like, no, those belong on the court. Like, and others, it's like, okay, that looks cool. You can yeah. fit. Um, the sneaker world is is really interesting though because, you know, um, sneakers were always like considered casual. Yeah. And I think now a lot of people think of them as maybe more formal. And when you look at the whole sneaker sort of industry, sneaker culture, um, you know, a lot of sneakers, of course, cost a lot of money and are kind of unattainable. Yeah. Um, and what you have to do to uh, get them is a lot more than what you had to do back in the 80s. You know? Yeah. I mean, back then, it was like, could you afford them? Mm-hmm. And if you could, you know, go to the store and cop. But now, like, you, where are you going to go? Um, you know. You, you, need gotta, a, you need a raffle. You need a bot. You need. <laughs> yeah, a goat or a stock X or, you know. You can't just roll in the Foot Locker and yeah. the best shoes aren't going to even be available exactly. in Foot Locker. What's in Foot Locker is going to be, you know, the kind of secondary level of sneaker. So it's, it's a different. And then, you know, you got people like Dior doing Jordans. And think about how much those shoes cost. You know, rare, kind of, you know, limited edition, um, like the, you know, joints Pharrell did for Adidas, Pharrell, Chanel. Yeah. Um, you know, you had to buy a Colette. So it's it's a whole different culture. I mean, I think I don't even know about, like, contemporary sneakers so much as everything's a drop now. Yeah. You know? Everything is like, you want to buy it, they're going to mention it two or three months before it hits, and, you know, you got to get a notification, as you say, raffle, and yeah. it's just it's just different. But I mean, like, you know, even with these collabs and stuff, right? These, you know, Dior and Jordan, right? That's a Jordan 1. That's a shoe kit that came out in 1985. Right. I'm asking, like, do you think that, like, a new pair of, like, Ja Morant's could be worn with an out? Because you're not really seeing that like that. It's maybe with little saying. kids. I see what you're saying. I mean, yeah, when I see, like, to me, most of the shoes that come out, like, I saw a quote recently in the last day or so where James Harden was saying he wants his shoes to be something that you could see from a mile away. Mm. Like, so I'm like, that's interesting. And then I looked and I'm like, but can you rock those? Like, yeah. really? Like if you hooping, yeah. but can you just rock them with a fit? Yeah. I don't know if they lend themselves to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe the designers were better. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know any of these contemporary shoes. You know, and all the top cats have their shoes, yeah. Anthony Edwards and Jason Tatum and Ja, but are those shoes you're going to rock with a fit? Yeah. And That's what I'm wondering. I mean, even quiet as it's kept, like, you know, like LeBron's. Like, you know, do people rock those with a fit? Nah. Um you know, I mean, when, when those Kobe joints first came up, nobody was rocking them. And then when they were in the bubble, they got to be real popular. So now some people are rocking those. Yeah. And because they were lows, like, you know, I think they probably lend themselves better to rocking with a fit. But, again, as you mentioned, like, some of these shoes look like they're just for hooping. Yeah, just for performance. I mean, the design on those J's, certainly the number ones, the first ones, I mean, you know, even number, even the twos, I mean, no shoes were originally made in Italy. Yeah. Um, there was something about those Jordans. The design was always yeah. just, I didn't like every Jordan, mm -hmm. but in general, like, the design was always on point. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons I like, like, old school Adidas, like Shell Toes, it was, like, much more minimalist mm -hmm. in design, so you could rock it. And it not look like you were just leaving the court. But yeah. So many of these shoes now that aren't like collabs that are associated with various players look too much like hoop shoes 
And I don't know. I think people probably have so many options from old school to other collabs, you know, Travis Scott, whatever. Like, there's so many opportunities for people to get sneakers in other ways. Maybe the specific basketball shoe is a thing, and then there are all these other things that you could go to if you're looking for more of a fashionable piece. Yeah, yeah, I think it's more of a, um, a designation now. It's not a – people not really blending basketball fashion with everyday fashion as much anymore. I don't – They're mostly wearing, if they're going to do that, maybe – some special kicks, you know, yeah, some yeah. specialized collab or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, you spoke more about uh hip hop style in the late night <clears throat> late nineties and early aughts, sorry, when uh talking about Sean John transitioning from trendy oversized streetwear to producing menswear. Um, reflecting the aspirational aspect that Puff had oh had always been promoting musically. So if hip hop comes from being a rebellious culture, why is it important to aspire to be something more than hip hop? Um, you know, I, I think hip hop has always been aspirational. The aspirations may have changed, yeah. but you know, um, I remember Andre Harrell had a group back in the day called Jekyll and Hyde, and and he was in the group. Right? He was in the group, yeah. right? Just before he became, you know, uh, executive. And he said, you know, we described ourselves as the champagne of rap. And so, you know, um, I think that aspirational element has always been there, right? You know, I remember my father telling me when he was, you know, my father's a guy who was sort of bebop jazz era. Mm -hmm. And he loved Brooks Brothers suits, mm -hmm. which was especially, you know, corporate, uh, know, style, like real corporate, um, very, very traditional. And then later I read Miles Davis talking about how much he loved Brooks Brothers. And Miles and my father were the same age. Yeah. And I'm like, that was a thing. And he goes, yeah, because, you know, we were trying to get people to look at us different than what we were. Like, you know, we came out of the street. Yeah. And he's like, we had briefcases and we would get on the bus, you know, going to work. And he's like, nobody know where you're going. You got on a suit and a briefcase. They don't know. Um, you know, and then when you get to work, you know, change and put on your uniform, and, you know. <laughs> and I laugh because I'm like, you know, people doing that now. But I didn't realize it was that. Yeah. It was like people always, I think, want to aspire to be something beyond what they are. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, all the cars people rap about in hip hop, that's aspiration. Yeah. Um, you know, it used to be the case that wearing a suit, you know, meant something. People don't really wear suits in that way anymore. But it used to be if, you know, you wore a suit, like you aspired to, you know, if you're wearing a suit, that means you're in charge or you're a boss or, you know, you're doing something that mandated that you wear a suit and tie as opposed to a working class uniform. So I think, you know, people have always aspired. It's just now maybe the aspirations are different. It's a lot more casual, it seems. Um, but I think it's always been there. And maybe you aspire to want to buy a basket. Well, that takes a lot of money. Yeah. What are you going to do to get that money? The dope game dried up. So, yeah. you know, what are you going to do now? Um, how are you going to get that money? So, again, it's a goal, I think. And if you have the right intent, maybe you can achieve that goal. But I think aspirations in general are a good thing because yeah. it's a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. But do you think that there can be, like, a contradictory element to that? Because, like, some people would say that, you could be like aspiring to be to embrace whiteness, right, and respectability politics by wearing, you know, wanting to wear suits and stuff. I guess I don't necessarily think of say in this case. To me, a suit is not white. Yeah, because anybody can wear a suit. Mm -hmm. I think the images people might have certainly back in the day when I was growing up, you know, um, like people who were in authority wore suits yeah. and growing up in the kind of environment I grew up in, 
you know, a lot of people got up and went to work every day. Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't in charge. They had blue collar gigs and they had, you know, uniforms relative to the gig they had. Um, so, you know, I mean, I grew up around like people who had to like get up and go to work and wear a certain thing. Somebody who wore, went to work in a suit every day, they didn't have that same level of like, you know, uh, blue collar, a, yeah. you know, <laughs> they were doing something that made them more money and that was less physically demanding. Yeah. So I always saw it as like, you know, I spent one summer working as a busboy in a private all white club in Detroit. Yeah. I spent one summer working laying bricks. I wasn't laying bricks, but I worked with these bricklayers. Um, you know, and you got on like a hard hat and you got on construction boots and it's the middle of the summer, man. That was for the birds. I'm <laughs> I'm not trying to be doing this. Yeah. I'm trying to put on a suit. Sweating for no reason. Yeah, and all like that. I, you know, no, nah, bro, that's gone. Like <laughs> I want to put on a suit and tie every day yeah. and be clean and pop my collar. So it was motivation for me. I wasn't trying to be white and I wasn't chasing respectability politics. I didn't want to do that hard work. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't want that to be, you know, the way I made a living because, you know, I was watching those people I was working with and Looking back on it, they were a lot younger than I realized. They just looked like old men to me because they worked so hard. Yeah. And I just felt like, you know, if I could do better, no, I'm not shading anybody who has yeah. to do that. But if I can do better, I'm not trying to kill myself out here doing this hard work. Yeah. I want to be clean. And so to me, it was aspiration. But, you know, I mean, you can take it in that direction, I guess. Um but I don't think there's anything wrong with aspiring for more than you have yeah. because you can use that as a way to motivate yourself. Yeah. Now, if you're aspiring to be somebody else, you're not, yeah. if you're like trying to imitate somebody else, that's maybe a little different. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying, especially as, uh, as a good way, good perspective to have as far as just like, you know, having the look of a person who, you know, you might have evolved from being a bricklayer to being a foreman, maybe, or owning the real estate company. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I, I mean, people look at you and, and you inspire them. Yeah. You know, um, like, oh, okay, what do you do? Who are you? How do you get to dress this way? Like, you know, you start at a certain place, and most of us, we don't have any control over where we start, but we mm -hmm. do have a bit more control over where we go. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, you know, I don't want to spend the rest of my life working here. I want to run things. Mm -hmm. I want to own things. I want to be the boss. Yeah. I mean, that's hip hop. Yeah. And so I think that's how you have to look at it. I mean, um, I'm like, you know, I love clothes and I'll be a college professor. I can wear what I want. If I want to wear a suit, I can. If I want to, you know, there's something else I can, um, but it's a stage, you know, and it'll give me the opportunity to wear my clothes. Um, if I work for General Motors at a plant, I couldn't do that. Yeah. So, you know, again, I'm not knocking anybody. If that's what you do, it's all good. But you might want to do something more than that. Mm -hmm. The clothes are just really a symbol of, you know, another walk of life. Yeah. I appreciate that perspective, though. Um. Who's the best dressed rapper of all time? Best dressed? Yeah. I don't know if anybody's ever asked me that. Um, I had to think about that one. <laughs> all right. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you been, you're, you're like first generation hip hop, so you got a large reference bank. I know that could be different. I'm, I'm just, I don't know that I've ever thought about it in yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I felt like, you know, yeah, I don't know. I, I need to think about that one. All right. So what about best dressed basketball player? Hmm. All time. All time. I mean, if you're looking at, like, Walt Frazier back in the 70s, his yeah. style embodied the time. But if you look.
dude, like you must have had a stylus or something. It was a little. It was. It was a little bit more subtle back then. And but it fit with the time. It, fit with it the looked time. like. I mean, he looked super fly. Yeah. Like in the seventies, like he had that look. And I'm like, how do you go from that to like you know what you have on <laughs> now? So that tells me he probably had a stylus. Um, because it wasn't natural, and it certainly didn't translate from, you know, one decade to the next. Um, but the guy we always looked at back then was Dr. J. He was yeah. kind of the model for everything. Um, you know, I also remember this moment when, like, you know, I, I was subscribing to GQ magazine when I was in middle school. Yeah, you mentioned that. Um, but you look at, like, you know, Magic was on the cover of GQ. Isaiah was on the cover of GQ. Pat Riley was on the cover of GQ. Jordan was on the cover of GQ. Grant Hill was on the cover of GQ. You know, so to me, it was like a thing where, like, are you cool enough to be on the cover of GQ? Uh, NBA players back then, you know, wore suits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they wore suits to games. They wore suits and ties to interviews and over time it got more casual but um again i don't know who i would say is the most fashionable there are some people's fashions that stood out you know again jordan had a run and then once then he was no <laughs> longer in like the center of attention yeah. it looked very different i've spent a lot of time on the nike campus and some of the people who worked there were like, yeah, if you saw Jordan on just an everyday basis, very different than seeing him when he was in the spotlight all the time. So, Big-ass jeans, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that became like a joke, uh, <laughs> you know, repping them big jeans like that. Um, I had a picture recently of, it was like Magic was talking to Steve Harvey, I think. But it was like from the 2000s yeah. when everybody was wearing those oversized suits. <laughs> um, it looked, it looked, uh, it definitely looked dated. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, them big suits, man. Jordan love a big suit, man. At first, though, I mean, see the thing about those suits, you know, Jordan's suits looked cool back then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now they look crazy, but back then those suits, that was like a look. Long coat. It was just like a look. Yeah. I mean, I thought back then it didn't bother me so much. Nowadays, you know, you want your uh, your shirt to show underneath a little more. Uh, where yeah. Jordan is like damn near half his hand. <laughs> and then, like, <laughs> you know, the, the length of the pants. And, you know, I guess the story was that Jordan went to his tailor and his tailor had, like, you know, done kind of a mock-up of a suit, but he wasn't finished. And Jordan thought that was the finished product. He liked it. So he's like, you know, give it to me like, you know, like this. Yeah. <laughs> but he was supposed to, like, alter it to the point yeah. that it was, like, more traditional size. But those big suits, man, that's that's an era. Man, uh, and I hope it uh, never gets, goes back to that. Because, you know, fashion happens in, like, in circles. Yeah, 20-year cycle of fashion, they say. And everybody's starting to wear, like, baggier clothes yeah. now after being skinny for so long. You see it, I'm sure you see it every day yeah. being on the college campus, yeah. And then when you look at like the images of people walking into the arenas for NBA games, um, you know, with these stylists, my friend and I joke all the time that these stylists are like fucking with people. <laughs> They're getting them to like wear like, you know. they experimenting on shit. them. <laughs> But and they don't know. Yeah. But they're like laughing behind their back. Can you believe I got him to wear that? <laughs> Yo, nah, you might be onto something because it, it's crazy. I like mean, a lot some of these, of these guys, dudes look crazy. Yeah, it's like uh, that don't really look like you. No, it look bro. like you were in a costume. Nah, that that ain't that ain't it. Yeah. Um. Why should people read Rappers Deluxe? Well, I, I think people should read it because it's a 50-year history of America. Mm. It's a 50-year history of the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. It's a 50-year history of culture and politics, of film, sports, music, art, fashion. Um, it's a document you know, of 
hip hop, but it's also a document of American existence. Yeah. Um, and I think of it as an experience because it's personal based on, you know, things from my own life, but it's also professional um, in terms of how I curated the photos and the writing that goes along with it. I consider it an experience. Yeah. Um, you know, shout out to, um, you know, the design, um, Hassan Rahim, 1201. I mean, the book, somebody described it. They said it feels almost like, you know, final. Um, like the way I, I wanted it to be like an experience. Like so the when you textured cover as well kind of adds to that experience. Exactly. Yeah. Like, so, you know, the whole package, I wanted to be something that you would experience. So when you feel it and then you open it up and you look at it, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that you can't put down. And when you do put it down, you want to go pick it back up again. Yeah. And, you know, you save it and, you know, you keep it. And you share it. it in a prominent place. You share it. Um, and it's also like an encyclopedia. You know, when I was a kid, the only books in my mother's house encyclopedia were either Britannica? religious books or encyclopedias. <laughs> like my father's place was different, but. It was always somebody trying to sell encyclopedias, right? <laughs> and, you know, I would ask my mother something like, what is this? You know, go read the encyclopedia. That's yeah. why I bought it, you know? I mean, this is an encyclopedia, but in a different sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not Britannica. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it covers so much material, you might find yourself referring to it, um, you know, when you want to find out some information. So I'm hoping that people who do purchase it, see it as that, you know, it's not something you're going to read and put down and forget about. It's the kind of thing you go back to over and over again. At least I hope so. Yeah. I, I think I come from the last era of uh, researching and doing book reports on encyclopedias because okay. my mom, we definitely had a whole bookshelf with the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, collection, and I definitely remember prior to using the internet even, early 2000s, late 90s, Go to the up encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Well, they paid for them encyclopedias. Oh my so, god. So you that had leather. To, you had you had to use them. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um who's your favorite rapper of all time? Just one? Oh, if you got several. I mean, I, I have what I call the Godhead. Yeah. Big J and Nas. Mm. I mean, like, you know. Jay says, and Marcy, like, you know, um, I'm from Marcy. Marcy don't raise no rent. Like, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, obviously I love Big, you know, because when they called me Notorious PhD, it fit. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the thing is, though, unfortunately, we only got two albums worth of material. Um, you know, Jay and Nas have had the opportunity to build a, much broader body of work. Um, but in terms of like lyricism and what they represented and the things they talked about, I mean, those are, uh, you know, three cats I have great appreciation for. Um, you know, back in the day, I was really into Chuck D and mm -hmm. things he was saying. That's my dude. Um, Ice Cube, you yeah. know, um, back in the day, a uh, cat like Scarface. Big Daddy Kane, um, you know, I used to listen to Brand Newbie in a lot yeah, back yeah. in the day. I mean, in terms of style, I mean, I still think Snoop style, Snoop may, Snoop may be the greatest stylist mm. in the history of hip hop. When Snoop came along, it changed the game in yeah. terms of rap style. Yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, I'm an OG, and so the things that hit me that way, I mean, there have been – Certainly great rapper since Andre 3000, of course. Um, you know, and then I hear cats like J. Cole and yeah. Drake now um, doing their thing. But, you know, Ghostface, yeah. Tang as a, as a whole, uh, especially Ghost, though. Um, man, it's so many. Yeah, 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 of course. So I mean, many. you've seen it all. Um, who's your favorite rapper right now? You mean in terms of contemporary cats? Yeah. I guess you Kendrick and I mean I, I would say and, yeah, Kendrick's Kendrick's cool. I, I like Section Eighty um, a lot. You know, um, I mean those other records are great too. But I mean, you know, J Cole, Drake, Drake, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, 
uh, yeah, between those two, throw in Kendrick, that's three. Um, his cat Westside Gun. Yeah. Um, I like his work. You know, I've been bumping this 21 Savage, you know. Mm-hmm. When I first heard 21 Savage, I'm like, okay, okay. And then it's like, yeah, I get it, you know. Yeah. 21. I get it, I get it. Like, and I listened to his whole album, um, American Dream, and I'm like, yeah, okay, all right. Um, again, you know, I listen to Lil Baby. Yeah. Uh, somebody say these cats are hot. You know, I, I want to listen to them and see if I feel them. Mm-hmm. I went through a period where I was listening to Future a lot. Um, but I probably listened to the Cold, Cold World, and uh, and Drake. Travis Scott's cool. Yeah. 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 yeah it evolved, man. But I, I appreciate that, you know, somebody of your age could. Music is information to me. So um, I used to be like a snobbish rap fan. Um, that's not. They're not lyricists, <laughs> but you know you you realized over time that you know this is hip hop is an ecosystem, you know, and you know every every organism is important in the ecosystem. So um, I mean, it's just like watching the NBA and you see these dudes now, like who are so talented and so skilled, um, who can do multiple things, mm-hmm. and you know I feel like the same way. I look at Drake, and I'm like, well, this is a contemporary rapper. Yeah. And he can sing too, you know, and he's got a vibe and he's got a following. And um, I try to, you know, as I say, I'm not the target audience, but yeah. it's like, okay, people are saying this cat's important. Let me check him out and see if I feel that too. And maybe I feel it, maybe I don't. But when I first heard, you know, last name ever, first name greatest, you know, when I heard yeah. Drake drop that, I'm like, oh, okay, I need to listen to this cat. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, I'm still in the mix. And when I heard First Person Shooter, I've been saying to people as I've been promoting the book, big as the what? Big as the Super Bowl. I mean, to have J. Cole and Drake, I mean, man, it's kind of like when I listen, I love the dope. Like, big. Yeah, it's and, going and, back and, and forth like that. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, and like, these are all stars. Yeah. You know, these ain't just everyday dudes, like, I mean, man, I love the dough. I love that song, you know. And Brooklyn's Finest, that back and forth. Brooklyn's Finest, I mean, you know, yeah, man. I mean, um, it's just, like, to have these two dudes, like, you know, back when I heard Chuck and Ice Cube and Kane, you know, on Burn, Hollywood, Burn. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you know, you get the best and they do their thing. That's really something you can listen to over and over and over again. All right, my last uh, generic question. <laughs> What's your all-time favorite rap album? Um, I'd probably say Ready to Die. Mm, I would say Life After Death. I feel like Life After Death is perfect. Yeah, Life After Death was great, but yeah. that's always tinged with the sadness of, you know, Big. Yeah. What had just happened. I love that album. Yeah. Um, and it's always hard to pick just one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, I could... Name, you know, America's Most Wanted, Take a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, um, Life After Death, Reasonable Doubt, The Blueprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, man, I mean, you know, yeah. uh, End of the 36 Chambers, uh, you know, uh, it is written. What is it? it is written. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I love Illmatic, but not as much as everybody else. I like. I it like, was written as better. I feel the same way. Yeah, it's yeah, more I of an feel, album. I, like feel, I feel the same way. No no disrespect. Yeah. You know, but I also, I like Stillmatic, and I like mm-hmm. God's Son, you know? Um, you know, I mean, man, it's hard when you yeah. narrow it down to one, it's hard to pick one. There's so many great albums. Yeah. Why is hip-hop important? Um, it's important because it represents America. Mm-hmm. And it represents black America. And it represents all of the things that I bring together in the book. Politics, you know, language, the way people talk, fashion, the way people dress, you know, what people watch on television, the movies mm-hmm. they watch, like, you know, contemporary art, like, you know, hip hop is is all encompassing. And this was what I was trying to get across in the book was the fact that it it touches on so many areas you may not even automatically think of when you think of hip hop. You might just think of the music, as a lot of people do, 
But the whole point of the book is this is a cultural movement of 50 years. There are no 50-year trends. There are no 50-year fads. Trends come and go. You know, fads come in style and go out of style. Yeah. 50 years, that's half a century. It's here right? to stay. I mean, so, you know, I mean, how many other things can, can, uh, can say that? I was listening to, real quick, Cat uh, had written a book about the 90s. I was listening to this on NPR. This was sometime, I think, last year. And fairly well-known writer, um, I don't necessarily need to call his name because it ain't that important to me. But, <laughs> you know, they asked this dude, why did you not wrote about the 90s, but you didn't write anything about hip-hop. Mm. And he goes, well, you know, I think he said something like, hip-hop is not something that's organic to my experience. And then he goes, but there's a lot of other genres of music from the 90s you could write about. And I kept thinking as I was listening to him, but none of those things you talk about have anything close to the influence yeah. hip hop has had. They didn't grow out of the 90s. They're part of that era. We're still talking about this and the 90s was 30, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I'm saying? Decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, how can you talk about any of these decades and not talk about hip hop? Yeah. So to me, like I say, Big as the Super Bowl, perhaps bigger, mm -hmm. um, but the Super Bowl is pretty big. Yeah, yeah. So for hip hop to be considered in that way, I think, speaks to just you know how much it made the world. That's how much it has an impact that we're talking about it in those terms. Yeah. What's next for Dr. Todd Boyd? Um, I mean, next as in later on today, or next as in. <laughs> You know, what am I doing next? In, your, um, in life, man. You know, I've been thinking about, as I was thinking about this book, the book starts in 1973, I keep thinking about, uh, you know, what I call the prequel. Not the sequel, but the prequel. What happened before? Mm. So something we were talking about, you know, a few questions back, just sort of what set the table for the emergence of hip-hop in the 70s, like, um, you know, August Wilson, the great playwright, had this thing where he wrote a play for every decade of the 20th century. Did he write Fences? Yeah. Yes. Um, he want, he, his, his objective was to write a play that covered every decade of the 20th century. So. 1900, 1910s, 1920s, like that. And, I mean, that's amazing, and he pulled it off. Um, so i just been thinking, like, as a cultural historian, like, if I can put together what came before hip-hop. Like, so if we start with Cool Herc, what came before that? Yeah. Like, what <clears throat> set the table for that to come about? And so I had to rewind back. So I have some things I'm thinking about. Um, I've also been talking to people because I wrote the book imagining a documentary series. I mean, I do so many documentaries. Uh, you know, I'm kind of reminded of Snoop had that album, The Last Meal, and Snoop was like, you know, other people have been eating off me. I'm going to eat off myself. <laughs> um you know, so my idea is when I wrote the book, like, I want to write this in a way that it's kind of like, you know, set up to be adapted into a documentary series yeah. and amplify my presence in the documentary so I'm not just one of many talking heads, but I'm the guide, I'm the host, I'm the on-screen narrator. And so I've been having some conversations about that and also having some conversations about actually I'm really into, you know, art like mm -hmm. contemporary art, which I talk about a lot in the book, and maybe some opportunities to, you know, do some work in a museum space as an art exhibit. Um, you know, so that's particular to this book, and then in terms of other ideas, I mean, I got a ton of ideas. It's just a question of, um, you know, which one of them actually emerges to the top in such a way that I, like, make that, you know, my next project. Yeah. 
Cool, man. Cool. Uh, my last question for you, man. Um, you're an educator, cultural commentator, orator, and writer. Why do words matter to you? Well, you know, when I was a kid in school, you know how you're in school and you get, like, your grades for your subjects. And then, I imagine they still do this in school. There's another section of your report card where they grade you on, like, you know, whether you late to class yeah. or, you know, that, you know what I'm saying, behavior, mm -hmm. right? So um, I would always get, you know, talks unnecessarily. <laughs> and my mother was somebody who was just, my mother was on my ass, boy, about everything, right? And what was so funny to me was I got talks unnecessarily so much, she didn't even bother me. <laughs> she didn't even, like, you know, she didn't even, like, you know, anything else, like, I'm going to get rid of the riot act. Like, yeah. you got a B plus when you should have got an A. Like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. for that, she didn't even say anything. She knew, like, I, you know, words of my life. Like, I talk. I've been talking since I was a little kid. Yeah. Um, and the fact that my mother didn't, like, you know, hold me accountable when those teachers were like, he talks unnecessarily. They kind of, they could have suppressed you. They could have. Um, and normally my mother was like, you know, don't cause me any problems by getting in trouble at school. Because, yeah. you know, she didn't say anything about it. So that signaled to me, like, she recognized, like, I don't want anybody suppressing you talking. Yeah. So words, I mean, that's that's my life. You know, I've been, man, I've been speaking in public since I was 12 years old. Like, so writing and commenting and, like, everything I do is is um, pretty much attached to words. Yeah. Um, everything. Maybe not fashion, but, you yeah. know, I got to tell you about how clean I am. So um, You're telling a story with the clothes, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the there you go. There you go. So <laughs> I'm a storyteller. I'm a wordsmith, um, words of my life. Um, I'll close with something Muhammad Ali said, when you consider the source, it's really profound. Ali said, words are more powerful than fist. That's deep. Yeah. Especially when you think about who said it. Yeah. So, you know, I feel that way, and I would say that's how I feel. Like Ali felt, words are more powerful than fist. Mm. Words are more powerful than fist, man. Words matter. Thank you once again, Dr. Boyd, for sitting down with me, you know, two hour and 21 minute interview. Um, I know you're a busy man, especially on this press run right now. So uh, I thank you. Um, I reached out to you months ago, right? I don't know if you remember, I emailed you. I, d I emailed you months ago, but you, you referred me to um, uh, your assistant and then he referred me to Cassidy, the publisher. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, and you said you was down for the interview. So. Um, and you know, you wanted to do it around the time of the book. So um, you kept your word. And uh, I appreciate that, you know. I don't, I, no disrespect, I don't remember that because a lot of people. Of course, me. yeah. But I think what I was saying was I knew the book was coming out. Yeah. And I felt like it would be more opportune yeah. to have the conversation around the book. So I appreciate your interest and mm -hmm. appreciate the opportunity to chop it up with you and talk about all these things. Um, and, uh, you know, glad that it worked out the way it did. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you. Um, yeah, once again, man, thank you for sitting down with me. I appreciate this. I uh, love the interview a lot. So words matter. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs>